thanks of course to CEP and KAS for uh, involving me in this. Uh, there have been several of these uh, related events which I've been involved in with Hans and which I've enjoyed greatly. Um, and um, I, I'll try and shorten my remarks if I can because I, I worry that we don't leave time for questions at the end. Um, let me just make a couple of remarks on some of the uh, discussion that's already taken place between the presentations uh, that might be helpful. There was a reference at one point to monitoring team disagreement with the United States uh, over the most recent report. And I just want to, I just want to say a couple of things about that. One is that um, you have to remember the monitoring team is, is pulling its information from member states and member states give a wide, wide sort of range of estimates, for example, of the number of, uh, the number of Al Qaeda or the number of uh, ISIL fighters in Afghanistan. And so they're trying to reconcile uh, fight, uh, figures which, um, and, and to create a sort of credible range uh, for what they think might be the uh, accurate figure. And even within that, there is scope for uh, a lot of variation depending on exactly who you count. Are you talking about fighters, just fighting aged males with guns? Uh, are you also talking about supporters or uh, administrators? Uh, but in some cases, the figures may also include dependents. And so what I always say about this is not to obsess over the numbers themselves, but to look at the trends to see whether the numbers are increasing. And certainly the number of uh, ISIL Khorasan, uh, that, 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 those numbers have increased over the past two years. Um, I would also say I, I, I ended up being quoted in, um, in, in, in uh, uh, US uh, media about the disagreement, so-called. Um, I think uh, the, the, the monitoring team's answer to what the US said about uh, it, its taking issue with some of the figures is that those figures were not necessarily um, contested by some parts of the US administration. In other words, there might be some disagreement or lack of communication within the US administration about numbers and about the nature of the threat from Al-Qaeda. Um, I don't think that anything that the monitoring team said in their last report, and I, I'm not in the monitoring team anymore, but of course I, I've talked to them very closely about it. Um, I don't think there's anything in there that they would, uh, that they would take back, where they would recognize, of course, that the figures, uh, as I said earlier, uh, can be contested. Uh, but that's a very difficult thing to, you know, I can remember on one occasion, the range of figures I was given for ISIL-K fighters um, uh, in one report that we wrote, uh, the lowest estimate from a member state was 1,000, the highest estimate was 10,000. Now that is a staggering range, it's very hard to make sense of that. And I remember at the time that we ended up, because we had a number of other member state estimates to triangulate, we ended up saying we thought that it was roughly 2,500 to 3,000. And I still stand by that. I think it was a, that was a reasonable triangulation of the many figures we've been given, but you see the difficulty uh, when your modus operandi is to, uh, is to uh, declassify member state uh, intelligence and the intelligence you're given is, is, is very widely uh, divergent. So that was, that was one point I wanted to make. Um, uh, moving to some of the things that uh, Guido said, which I thought were very, very uh, interesting, and, 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 uh, and, and I, I agree with them. Um, I wanted to add one point about the reason why it's difficult for Al-Qaeda to acknowledge SAFE as the uh, head of Al-Qaeda. It's not just about Iranian sensitivities, it's also about Taliban sensitivities. The Taliban, of course, contest that Zawahiri was killed in Kabul by a US strike. Um, however absurd that may seem to us, they contest it. And Al-Qaeda, which has uh, repeatedly sworn allegiance to the Taliban, cannot embarrass the Taliban by uh, making an announcement of a new leader, the implication of which would be that the United States was telling the truth and the Taliban was not. Um, I wanted to add, because we haven't really heard much about it, I just want to men mention Al-Shabaab. I do think Al-Shabaab is very significant in all of this picture um, as an Al-Qaeda affiliate in Somalia. Very successful, very threatening, with a history of foreign terrorist fighters and a history of uh, operations uh, either executed or planned 
outside Somalia and even outside the region. Um, and Al-Shabaab was perhaps the loudest uh, branch of Al-Qaeda to celebrate the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. And I think this point about the Taliban inspiration for uh, Al-Qaeda uh, and Al-Qaeda's attempts to overturn fragile jurisdictions in Africa, and Guido already mentioned, um, you know, the JNIM, uh, which, is, which is doing a pretty good job of destabilizing both Mali and Burkina Faso. Uh, we should not forget that Al-Shabaab has long been destabilizing Somalia and uh, the signs for long-term stabilization of Somalia do not look good. So this is one of the dangers, as Hans said, you know, these have been a couple of good years for the global jihadi uh, movement in the conflict zones, not in the non-conflict zones. In the non-conflict zones, uh, these uh, groups have uh, been much less effective um, than they were uh, 10 to seven years ago. Um, I wanted to also, again, just to, just to emphasize what Guido said about Syria. Um, I think I, I always came back to this whenever we were primarily concerned with Afghanistan or primarily concerned with events in Africa in the monitoring team, I always used to force the conversation back to Syria which is where I see the heart of the problem. And it's because Syria is so important. It's, first of all, you know, when we talk about foreign terrorist fighters, um, you know, the, the people that were attracted into the caliphate, um, they found it very easy to get there. Um, it's a lot easier to get to Syria and, and to the Syria-Iraq border area than it is to get to Afghanistan. And the, the sort of underlying sort of, Proof of Syria is that up until the Arab Spring, there was a kind of a intercommunal sort of tolerance of the um, strange sort of gangster-like um, uh, Alawite uh, ruling uh, clique, and a sense that at least that was uh, preventing any kind of tyranny of the majority, and that there was social liberalism, and that as long as you you know, as long as you didn't um, fall out with the or with the authorities themselves, um, you know, you could you could live a pretty uh, a pretty decent, peaceful, uh, prosperous life, and that kind of uh, Pax Astad will never be able to be reestablished in Syria. You know, a genie has been released from the bottle, um, and until the majority Sunni Arab community feels that its rights uh, are, you know, in some way, um, in some way, uh, you know, vindicated and, and protected. Um, we have to anticipate that there will always be space for these extremist groups in Syria. And I think they know that. I think that's why, you know, even those that have been willing to sort of, to be in sort of very exposed areas being attacked by various opponents um, and taking heavy losses. Nevertheless, they, 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 they hang on in Syria because in Syria more than anywhere else, they see, uh, the, if you like, the medium to long-term prospect of actual victory. Um, mention of Iran, I, again, I wanted to make a couple of comments on that. I think Iran is just very comfortable with um, with 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 pursuing um, apparently contradictory policies, um, and I think they you know if you think about the Iranian relationship with Hamas with Palestinian Islamic Jihad, um, there's no um, the Iranian the, you know the, the Iranians the Iranians are perfectly capable of uh, reaching out across that sectarian divide if they see it as being in their tactical interests. And uh, this is, of course, is also true of the Haqqani network in Afghanistan. Uh, and, and it, I, you know, there's an interesting comparison to be made between these uh, Afghanistan under the Taliban and Iran under the Haqqani's, uh, or under, under the Taliban, but with the Haqqani's sort of having a very uh, privileged position in Afghanistan. Um, and of course, the Haqqani network has a very good relationship with the uh, Iranian intelligence with the IRGC Quds Force and with the MYS. Uh, so um, both of these sort of um, very anti-Western uh, 
um, uh, bodies are capable of managing ambivalence and working with each other, even if they don't really like each other, even if they see each other as a long-term threat. Um, and and it's, so, so I don't think we should be at all surprised that Iran is still hosting the Al-Qaeda leadership. Um, and you know, there's an element of a reinsurance policy there as well, of course, you know, if, if Saif al-Adil is the head of Al-Qaeda and he's in Iran, then that does uh, limit uh, what uh, Al-Qaeda, what threat Al-Qaeda could pose to Iran. Um, and then camps, I just wanted to mention the camps point as well, because I think it's an important one. Um, undoubtedly, it is the right thing to do to bring people home. I think that's very clear. One of the powerful things about the monitoring team was that we were able to make that argument from a purely security point of view. And I don't want to diminish the humanitarian or the human rights point of view, but those are both important. But other people are making that argument and that argument doesn't always resonate with electorates. But we were making the argument from the threat point of view that this threat is incubating and it's getting worse. And unless you get on the front foot and bring people home, and give them the chance to disengage from what many regard as a mistake that they made in the past, then you are uh, ultimately you're kicking the can down the road and the, the, the threat will be more severe in the future as, you know, five year olds who could have been easily rescued and rehabilitated, you know, over time grow into teenagers who are brutalized and bitter. Um, so this is this is crucial. I'm glad that Germany is uh, taking a proactive uh, role. I was uh, in a UN event just last week talking about this. Uh, the point was made that of the sort of 60 or so member states that still have nationals in Al Hol and Al Raj camps in Syria, um, about 25 have got less than fewer than 10 nationals. And it's worth the push now. And if Germany has 30, it's worth the push. Let's get these people back because the Kazakh experience and I, I don't I don't know the Uzbek or the Tajik experience as well. And I know that we should look at the full range of experience on this. But there is a fair amount of empirical evidence of people being ready to disengage and ready to put this behind them and to try to uh, uh, try to sort of embark on a new life. We also saw that a little bit with some of the some of the FTFs who left Syria under the pretense of going to Afghanistan. But once they got to Turkey, they didn't go on to Afghanistan. They just wanted to get out of Syria and return to making money and sending remittances to, uh, to their families. So I don't want to be complacent about this. There will be a recidivism rate. There will definitely be attacks from former FTFs uh, and quite possibly from, uh, from uh, you know, youth who were children perhaps even born in the caliphate so-called um but uh the the way to deal with that is to be proactive and not to just wish the problem away and hope that by the time that it becomes a problem you're no longer in your posting or in office as a politician which i think I've, i fear is the calculation that some people have made in indonesia it was interesting that the it was quite clear the security authorities assessed that repatriation was the right thing to do. It was the politicians, mindful of the sensitivities of the electorate, that were against it. And I think that may well be true in some of the uh, reticent uh, European countries as well. So sorry to go on at length, but I just thought it was helpful to sort of expand the debate that's already been taking place. That leaves me really just a couple of minutes to co comment on the um, on the report, the CEPKS report. And I think what I want to say about the CEPKS report is I think it's a great report and I think everybody should read it and they should read the whole of it because it's a fantastic resource. Um, there's a huge amount of scholarship in there and a huge amount of relevant, important data. And it's also worth reading it alongside the monitoring team reports, which, uh, which uh, Sophia, for example, has so generously credited uh, already. Um, the monitoring team uh, published a report in February, which was on ISIL Al-Qaeda uh, globally. They published a report that Sophia also referenced um, just a few weeks ago, which was specifically on Afghanistan and the Taliban and the uh, terrorist groups in Afghanistan. 
Um, and uh, as we speak, the monitoring team is uh, putting the finishing touches to its new Al Qaeda and ISIL report, which will be submitted uh, in New York uh, at the end of this month and is likely to be published by the end of July. Once that comes out, we'll have three very, very short space, you know, three reports that have come out in quick succession covering full range of these issues. And uh, that, will, that will be sort of the optimum point of uh, input from the monitoring team. But we're already pretty well placed because we have the recent uh, ISIL Al Qaeda report from only a few months ago. And we have the very recent uh, Taliban Afghanistan report um, from just a couple of weeks ago. And I think when you juxtapose those reports with the CPKAS report, you get a really uh, impressive and, and really vital piece of analysis about the fact that Afghanistan matters. And it matters, again, the humanitarian side of things, the human rights side of things, these things are really important. I don't minimize them, but there are many other people who are emphasizing them and are dealing with them. And the things that I think are perhaps not being uh, emphasized sufficiently um, are the security implications of the Taliban in power in Afghanistan. Now, already, I think those have been very well brought out by Sophia and Guido. So I don't really want to uh, go into the detail of that. But what I do want to say is that, I, is that the, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda remain firmly allied with each other. There's no question about that. And Zawahiri was the guest of the Haqqanis, and then he was taken out in uh, Kabul. Um, but there are still Al-Qaeda people in uh, Afghanistan. There is Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, which is a, uh, which is a, uh, uh, a franchise of Al-Qaeda, which is present in Afghanistan, and which is, again, very closely linked with the Taliban. Uh, the latest monitoring team report talks about Al-Qaeda instruction manuals being taught in Afghan military uh, camps under, Tal under the Taliban, and it talks about various uh, Al-Qaeda figures who have resurfaced and are active and have camps, uh, even though, as we have already acknowledged, the United States has some difficulties with this analysis. Um, the fact of the matter is that the Haqqani network has the ability to naturalize people if it wants to. It has the interior ministry, it has ID cards, it has uh, the, it, 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 it deliberately took the portfolios that would be relevant to this. So uh, we may see some of these people actually not being foreigners anymore. They may be Afghans, but that, they may also then have uh, valid Afghan passports, which will enable them to travel. And that is something to be thought about. Uh, I think that the Haqqani network intent here is to cater for a number of potential scenarios, but they certainly include uh, future terrorist operations because that is the track record of the Haqqanis and Sirajuddin al Haqqani, uh, of course, uh, is extremely close to the Al-Qaeda leadership. So then we should mention ISIL-K. Um, ISIL-K, um, I think, in this respect, we can say, like Al Qaeda uh, in Afghanistan, doesn't presently uh, pose a developed threat uh, globally. Uh, it, I don't think it has that capability. Guido has already mentioned the fact that it's entirely possible for there to be facilitation or inspiration uh, from ISIL K for events in Europe, and that's true. But the kind of developed external operations capability that ISIL K used to have, uh, they don't have at the moment, or that ISIL globally used to have, they don't have at the moment. But there is certainly the aspiration to recreate it. They haven't done it yet. Um, there is a cross-border threat, that's quite clear. Um, we've seen uh, bits and pieces of uh, activity on the Uzbek and Tajik uh, border. We've seen a lot on the Pakistani border. And the problem here is that these groups, and, and I recognize that they don't, they're not they are not Al-Qaeda groups. Many of them are uh, aligned with or sympathetic to Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Some of them entertain sympathies for ISIL-K. Um, but predominantly, these groups in Afghanistan are, um, are, are opposed to uh, neighboring countries. So we might be talking about the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, Jamat Ansarullah, which is Tajik. Uh, we might be talking about ETIM, TIP, Uyghur. 
uh, we might be talking about the TTP, which is the biggest of all of these groups and, the, and, the, and currently the most threatening to Pakistan. Um, the difficulty that the Afghan Taliban is having is that they, they want to develop relations with their neighbors, but they don't want to uh, betray their, as they see it, their, their sort of um, fellow fighters, uh, comrades in arms. And of course, they're afraid that if they start to make difficult compromises to govern, they're afraid that ISIL-K will be able to recruit disaffected uh, Talibs and disaffected members of these groups. This is one of the reasons why the, why the Taliban uh, are, have proved uh, to be um, uh, really ineffective and uh, hardline and unimaginative in government. Um, and then the, the final point I want to make is I want to Scotch this um, discussion that uh, that, that uh, some internationals uh, want to have about the Taliban as a counter-terrorist partner, a partner for counter-terrorism. The Taliban won't even tell the truth about the situation uh, in Afghanistan. They won't. They they lie about the fact they they, they say there are no foreign fighters present. Uh, they do acknowledge the presence of ISIL for Assam, but then they they, they, they even change them their tune on that when it suits them. Um, you can't, you know, that you're dealing with a, uh, you're dealing with an organization that is incapable of being honest with foreign partners. Um, so my enemy's enemy is my friend will not work uh, in mobilizing the Taliban against ISIL-K. The Taliban are mobilized against ISIL-K anyway, but, you know, they can't be relied upon to assess ISIL-K accurately. They won't share their assessment honestly about any of these groups. They won't act responsibly or with due process in partnership against ISIL-K or against anybody else. And I, I want to underline the due process point here. As all counterterrorism professionals will acknowledge, in order not to be counterproductive, CT work has to be legally and ethically compliant with due regard for human rights. Now, the Taliban are a human rights black hole. Can you imagine what a joint CT operation with the Taliban would look like? You would have no control, no assurance of the conduct of arrests, interrogations, or the accuracy or exploitation of leads. You would have no assurance that your partners were not pursuing a hidden agenda. You would have no confidence even that those being targeted were not identified for reasons of personal or political malice. You might even find yourself working on a hostage release scenario where the Haqqanis actually orchestrated the hostage taking in the first place. So, you know, this I think is so important to not to be indulge in wishful thinking or to be naive about what the Taliban do and do not represent in this area. And finally, the very last thing I'll say, this is not really about narcotics, um, right, you know, this, this particular webinar, but the, it's really worth looking at the, what the KSCP report says about narcotics, because it says a lot about the Taliban, about the fact that the kind of uh, criminals and thugs in their ranks that they still depend on and who are still untouchables uh, and who are still profiteering from drugs uh, whether it's uh, poppy or whether it's uh, methamphetamine uh, and this is destabilizing the neighboring countries and it's and it, of course it's reaching the streets of Europe and the streets of North America and indeed many other places around the world um, and this is a really important sign of whether the Taliban are serious and this is where I think people should have pay, pay more attention and whether Doha accords were woefully uh, inadequate because they, they they clearly considered this uh, this issue was not something that they uh, wanted to address. And so my final point then is that looking at counter-narcotics as well as counter-terrorism, I would recommend that the international community should focus on reinforcing the neighbours of Afghanistan it should pursue a neighbor's first policy in Afghanistan. The great thing about the neighbors is that they have no choice but to deal with the Taliban because they have a border with Afghanistan and therefore uh, they've got to, at the very least, manage that border. 
They also have good intelligence on Afghanistan because they have border communities and they have a long history of studying Afghanistan. And because of the ethnicities uh, within Afghanistan and the relations that exist uh, between uh, Afghans and their neighbors. Um, so it's the neighbors who have leverage. It's the neighbors who will not allow themselves to indulge in wishful thinking or to be fooled by the Taliban. They'll see what the Taliban actually do and they will use leverage and they'll use incentives. And so I think the best thing that the international community can do is to help to reinforce the neighborhood community and encourage the neighbors to have each other's backs. We've already talked about Iran as problematic. Of course, Iran is problematic. But even so, within that neighborhood forum, there is scope for all of those countries to work together to put pressure on the Taliban not to destabilize the region. And that in itself would give the international community a little more reassurance about the fact that Afghanistan was not posing a threat globally. Thank you very much.